you you mentioned that um you know you spent three years closer to death than life and that that led to this amazing spiritual awakening awakening and embracing of other people's humanity what do you mean by that what does yeah. explain that i love that yeah um i think first i had to really embrace my own humanity that I have vulnerabilities, that I am um, frail, that I am not this superwoman. So growing up, I um, was brought up to super achieve, to super achieve at sports, to super achieve at school, um, to not have any needs, and also not to be given proper equipment to compete. But yet I still was supposed to like win. And um, I develop this counterphobic macho at invincible attitude uh, luckily god made me an athlete most of the people in my family are really athletic which was a blessing because i feel like that saved me if i didn't have that uh, as a child i i don't really know how i would have felt good um and adequate even if it was momentarily when i was succeeding at sports but I very much I was brought up um, the military motto of we're going to you know break you down, but instead of building you back up, which is what they think they do in the military, <laughs> or I hope they do, um, my parents didn't build us back up. So as a consequence of that, I have this what I call it's in the book this warrior queen attitude of I should be able to go help anyone in any situation no matter how dangerous it is, um, both of us should be fine. And that got me so far in life. And, um, you know, there are consequences to going to dangerous places, um, both physically, emotionally, psychologically. So similar to you, I have nightmares of planes flying into buildings. I was also a first responder at 9-11 um, and I developed breast cancer, but I have intrusive thoughts of um, people jumping out of tall buildings on fire and, and, and such things. But what I found is what you said, that even though it was the worst thing I've ever been through, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, um, when I was sick and dying, I really was the most spiritually expanded. And I felt interconnected with spirit, God, the universe, however you want to look at it. I, I, you know, I, when I say a spiritual awakening, I don't mean a religious awakening, but mm -hmm. that I felt that I was held um, by the universe and seen and loved. And I never, ever <laughs> had that feeling before. And I knew it. I knew it deep down in my soul. And um, it was a, it was a profound feeling of harmony and joy which I don't think I had ever experienced before, ironically, even though I was really, really sick. I, I, I was closer to death than life. I, you know, my patients will remind me about how sick I was and um, mm. how sickly I looked and how much better I look now. I, because when you're traumatized like that, you don't really, you don't remember really. It's, it's hard for you to hold on to it. And, um, yeah, it just it's it's the irony of of this that the best thing that ever happened to me was being poisoned because I changed and grew and expanded as a person. For instance, I forgave my family more and I understood more um, the way they are, why they are. I mean, I always understood it. Both my parents grew up um, in really um, poor families. They. Uh, had nothing that my dad was a, a depression baby he his father came here at the age of 16 from italy to make money to bring the rest of his family he welded iron for the george washington bridge and was such a hard worker my grandfather but you know he didn't know how to love he didn't he 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 didn't have the luxury of learning how to love i mean he he had to work really from an early age on to support his family and um he was really hard like he he was impossible to please and 
my father was very similar. Like he demanded a lot of us and he wasn't ever going to um, tell us we did a good job. I have a funny story about that, which I can share with you, which is I played basketball in high school and uh, there was a girl who um, was the daughter of the head of the phys ed department. So she, she needed to get a scholarship to go to college. I would be beating her in points in the game. So I would be pulled out of the game so that she would have more points than me uh, in the game. And my father would always say, you know, she was a, she was a more polished uh, basketball player than me. Like I had just played with boys and my brothers, but she had been um, primed by her father from an early age to be a great basketball player. I was just a really natural athlete. And it was like right before he died, he died at 91, that he said to me, oh, and you were actually a better player than this woman. And I mean, I felt so bad for him because it, at that point, it didn't mean anything to me. Like it, it like I had already resolved that, the, that those horrible feelings in high school, because I think I was playing basketball to try to get his love and recognition. Uh, but I just felt that I, I could really forgive my parents and that I was more empathic in particular to my mother who really um, projected a lot of her undigested uh, trauma with her mother on me because her mother had 12 kids. My mom was the oldest girl. So she had to often be a parent to her siblings and also worked her way through college as well as my father did. And uh, she was embarrassed at her mother's pregnancies. And I think she projected all of that on me, but, you know, I always understood it psychologically. So it, I can't even explain it. I just, felt more love and compassion to them. Uh, when I when I woke up from surgery after my mastectomy, I had this experience of not being in the world. It really felt like I was in a spiritual realm. It was total light. And it, something told me, you know, have more empathy for your mother. And um, ever since then, I really have. I have more love and empathy for her. So... Yeah, I think that's so, and I don't know what it is with the with empathy and and love and all that in the sense that I you know I, I had a somewhat of a similar upbringing and and I write a talk about in my book that's coming out with my mother who I love her because she did the best she could with what she had and and when I when I speak to people about PTSD I say you know the wild thing is I mean even if you go back to the beginning of the last century you went into basically world war one uh the spanish flu uh, the great depression world war ii and i'm like all these people were so traumatized and there was no help and i you know i sometimes say you know it's wild when you think about world war ii a huge percentage of the population goes off to war. Those that aren't at war are supporting the war effort and worried about their loved ones who are overseas. So there's that trauma. Everybody comes home. There's this big rise in um, like fraternal organizations, the Masons, the Elks Lodge, the Moose Lodge. And I said, what do they all have in common? All the men get dressed up in their suits, which is like a uniform, and they go hang out with their buddies who were probably involved in the war somehow, and they all have drinks to help cope. And it's at that same time in the fifties, when the women who were expected to get up and, you know, like clean the house dressed up in your right. uniform, um, the women who are dealing with all these men that came home from war, that's when the, you know, volume and everything really took off, you know, mother's a little helper. And then we move into the sixties and the sixties kind of ignite. And I'm like, it's just been this repeat cycle of this, of this trauma. And when it comes to the empathy side, somewhere during my process, empathy just became, and I, and it was, I think it was when I was diving into my core values, character, love, hope, and independence. And that I really started looking for people's why, you know, and as in a form of empathy, like why are they doing what they do? Why do they believe it? Because a lot of it isn't 
they're not it's not that they necessarily have control they're they're doing why they bear responsibility for their actions there's still there's so much influence that has shaped how they're going to behave moving down the world i in my case i i'm 100% believe that the reason i became a lifeguard and then an emt a paramedic at 21 then i i that was in a firefighter in in southern california well, that's not good enough. Let me become an army ranger and let me constantly like this thing of I'm going to protect the world. But really what I was doing was protecting, trying to in some weird way, trying to protect myself. Well, I think I think I think because I've done the same thing. It's undoing. It's trying to undo the trauma of your childhood. Mm-hmm. I, too, was a lifeguard and constantly. <laughs> You know, I played professional tennis when I was 35. I wanted to play when I was 13, but my family didn't support me. I played first in college and high school, and then that wasn't enough. Then I had to become this elite endurance athlete. It was always like trying to prove my worthiness, try to, trying to undo the trauma of my childhood. I was literally running from my rage and anger with my mother and trying to undo the trauma of, of your childhood. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it just <doesn't> no. <laughs> <laughs> How does, so how does that, when, when people and in, in my space, right. I, in the preparedness space, people are preparing because they're worried about the future. They're worried about problems. And so, which is, which is a fear-based thing. Right. And I know when I, I did six weeks for my post-traumatic stress in Utah and an inpatient, and I remember my therapist who she was traumatized. She was, she could never be good enough. So she was a double PhD. <laughs> and um, I, I remember her telling me that, um, or, or telling the group that 65 plus percent of first responders and military and people in those kind of professions all have traumatic childhoods. How does the, tr- how does those and and I, I try to tell people like it's not necessarily that you had to have an abusive childhood. It's your perception of not being safe, your perception of that as a child, which doesn't always understand understand everything. How does that set us up for this? You know, these not feeling safe down the road or trying to do these things to keep ourselves safe. How does that get us down that path? Yeah, I think it's the gift of, there, there's a book on it, and I can't remember the woman's name, but it's the story of the gifted child, uh-huh. where the child is striving in, in, in sports or in achievement or academically to try to, you know, you twist yourself into a pretzel to try to get your parents to change. They have their own trauma and their own scars and they're just trying to survive and you want to get them to recognize you and to love you and it doesn't happen um and i think it's it's this gift it it is it's the story of, of the gifted child where i think you're able to strive um to try to achieve and to do um mm-hmm. to super perform I, I feel like I was a poster for super performing at everything. I had to excel at everything. And and it was never good enough. It was always the next race I had to win or how do I up the ante? Um, you know, I'll run like a, a triple Iron Man um, in order to feel worthy. And it, it didn't it, it didn't work. And ironically, getting poisoned and being a, a chronic bedridden patient except for being able to struggle to crawl literally to go to work was what expanded me and what made me realize my own beauty and people's beauty and people's humanity and that we all have problems and issues and struggles it's, it's just endemic to to humankind um, the human condition yeah I, I just think it's it's a struggle a lot of children have that are able to um, achieve and perform and that are gifted. And um, it's a double-edged sword. How do the traumatic experiences that we have as an adult lead to the anxiety, the depression, I mean, panic attacks, you know, and I'm getting, going into all my personal experiences where, you know, one day you're this, you know, like you, you're this powerful 
person who is you know doing multiple triathlons you're going to war zones and all of this and you know in my case you know somewhat similar and then the next then you end up i can't leave the house because i'm and and i'm i didn't realize that i was terrified but i can't leave the house because of this i'm just in a non-stop panic attack or a non-stop depression difficult to even taking a shower yes yeah no i think that if PTSD is so common um, in people that have, like you, been in war zones and seen horrible trauma. I think it. How can you not have PTSD? I mm-hmm. mean, if you if you don't have that empathy, I really think something is is off um, with that person. But what happens with trauma in particular is that trauma is processed differently in the central nervous system than regular memory so regular memory is is stored in the prefrontal cortex so it has verbal memory to it so that we can relate it as a story but when you have a significant trauma it's stored in the amygdala and it's so it's it's fragmented in time um it can appear like the trauma is happening in the present, the past, and the future, or all of those things at the same time. It's fragmented. It um, doesn't, it is not verbal memory. It is visual memory. So that's why you get flashbacks in, in pieces and parcels of it because it's not fully digested because it's too overwhelming to the human psyche to process and terrifying. And um, it's, nonverbal visual memory. So often what happens is that people that have a significant trauma will have flashbacks during the day and actually can feel like they're in that war zone, if it's in a war zone, that they're being shot at or that they're in danger and it feels real. Like they'll hear a loud sound and that loud sound will be fire or a bomb or whatever trauma that they had that they're reliving it again and it feels really real and this it's a way for the psyche to try to get the person to put the pieces of the puzzle together which is so hard to do and you know it's been my life journey helping people with significant sexual physical trauma to remember it not just as a daydream or a nightmare, but to actually remember what happened and not be that um, dissociated, that they're outside of their body, that they can begin to experience it in their body and remember more what happened. So it's more of of a timeline and a story and they begin to uncover more and more memories of it. And then that they can begin to associate feelings to it. Because what happens with a significant trauma, it's flight or flight. You are going to flee to survive. So you're not going to process emotions. You don't have that luxury. Um, With trauma memory, you, you have to begin to get in touch with the intense anxiety, the intense fear, the sadness, the loss, the depression. All of these things are underlying um, post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative disorder. I've treated patients that were severely sexually abused as children, young, young children, and they develop different personalities as a defense mechanism to process and keep that, that sexual abuse memories separate so that otherwise it's too overwhelming for for a a child to be sexually abused and you know it's 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 life-threatening um and to get them to feel safe enough and aware enough and and this is a lifelong process i i will say sure yeah to begin to recognize um those different personalities and begin to put the pieces of the the puzzle together with their their sexual um, history and their trauma and and it even though it's processing such horrible anxiety and loss and fear and profound depression and feelings of unworthiness and hopelessness and helplessness that you you have to process all that and digest it and get in touch with it, which is horrible. But the beauty of it is, is that 
if you can do that, and many people can do that, and I help many people do that, um, that then they can transcend that that trauma, and they can expand their life. They can be more um, expansive and proactive in their life. So it's it's very common for people like you, for people like me that have been in war zones, that have put ourselves on the front lines, that at minimum, you're going to have post-traumatic stress disorder, not, <laughs> if not dissociative disorder, um, panic attacks, depression, anxiety. Yes. You mentioned something that, that really touched with me, and, and it's um, so I, I mentioned I went to Michigan to work on my live in the woods. And actually, I didn't go there to do that. It was a kind of a byproduct of COVID. I didn't want to be in Las Vegas. I'd rather be in the woods of Michigan when they were, all the crazy was going on. And one of the things I found, and, and I, I tell people, I go, I don't think anymore. I feel, right? And you mentioned going into your body. I am very big on my body sensations. And I know, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. And, and it makes me excited when I talk to someone who mentions this and understands it because so many people think it's this woo woo thing and it's, but my body, I feel sensations in my body all day long. And it's, I, and I equate it to, it's my subconscious that's monitoring the 24 seven, trying to protect me and, and that it, uh, it can't communicate. So it, it can't communicate with speech. So it does, it communicates through sensations by hitting alarm bells. Or in my case now, before all I ever felt was bad sensations. A couple of years ago, that's all I felt, just terrible sensations. Now I feel good sensations. And it's kind of like, um, I, I, I have this beam and I, you know, and as, and I'll throw up ideas or thoughts or solutions to problems and, if it doesn't feel good, I'm like, oh, that's not the solution. And I go till I actually get this full glowing, wonderful sensation in my chest. I go, that's the answer closer to where I need to be. Can you, can you go into that for people? Sure. Um, no, I think it's such a beautiful example of your evolution and your processing your trauma, which it's so inspirational because it's hard. It's very hard work, and it's getting in touch with um, horrible feelings of loss and tragedy and sorrow. So, yeah, I think what happens is that many of us are function outside of our bodies, especially in the Western world where we have to do, 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 where we have to race, 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 race to work and home and obligations and often we aren't even aware of what we're feeling. We're not in our body, we're outside of our body. It's sort of like we're a hamster on a treadmill, just racing and we're shut down, we're dissociated. I, I believe that all of us, and I'm talking about healthy people now, have dissociated self states that, that we go into and out of throughout the day that we're not even aware of, that, that, that it's, it's a result of of trauma of trauma and it's very unconscious so i do feel that you have to process feelings of loss look being born is um traumatic uh, in, mm -hmm. in life um all of us experience loss and tragedy and sickness and death and dying and it's part of of being alive and i think you have to begin to process those things in order to begin to process the good things and in order to begin to be in your body. Um, just like you said, if we don't process um, unconscious feelings of loss or pain or sorrow, what happens often is it goes into our body parts. So for instance, I'll give you an example. A patient of mine was so enraged at her mother and it was during her wedding where her mother wouldn't recognize her and kept on telling her she had to do all these things to be a good daughter, that the, the my patient went to try to hit her mother in the face and her arm went, went like she had paralysis of her hand. So like that's an instance of she was so rageful and she didn't process it and it went to a body part. And in that instance, maybe it was a good thing, although I would prefer my patient to be aware of her rage and 
and be able to assert herself verbally and tell her mother, you know, look, this is very painful for me. You're not recognizing me as always. This is my special day. I'm getting married. Please, could you just leave me alone and have some empathy for a moment? That's an example of it. Um, and and there are many examples of it with people um, believing they're paralyzed when it's an, a, it's an emotion that they put into their spine, for instance, and they, they really believe that they're paralyzed. I mean, that those are extreme instances of it, um, but it's very common. And I myself um, have done that. And, you know, similar to you, have been very much outside of my body, dissociated. And I really feel like being poisoned has put me more in my body, ironically, and that I can feel if I'm tired and I need to rest, which is a constant lesson for me. But <laughs> that, you know, if I have a pain or an ache, I, I process it. I don't tell myself, just suck it up. You're a big baby. Like, just get out the door and go run, which is what I always did. Um, that I'm much more aware of what I'm feeling and thinking. And I'm, I am more in my body. And it, I just think that is, it is so important with, evolving um through feelings of loss and and tragedy yeah that and 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 most of us do have dis these dissociated self states that and i'm talking healthy people here not like personality disorder or a sure. fake state where someone goes to a, a different town and forgets their past existence i'm just talking people who are functional who have different uh, dissociated self states throughout the day and just aren't even aware of it yeah 